Now, the way of making the reactive oxygens from the blue light that yep. you mentioned, you know, this fact that this blue visible light, not not far ultraviolet light, that that has this effect. When you when you excite a porphyrin uh, with blue light, uh, you 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 change the uh, you, you you induce an electronic transition within the porphyrin to a higher excited state. And in fact, with blue light, I think you excite to the second electronic level, and uh, that excitation can um, result in a. A, a radiationless transfer to another higher level, a bit lower down, uh, which is metastable and it hangs around for a while. And while it's hanging around in that excited state, this porphyrin can interact with an oxygen molecule and can change the, uh, the, the, the excited state of an oxygen molecule from a triplet state to a singlet state. So this is a quantum mechanical process mm -hmm. that happens when oxygen and porphyrin molecules come close together. And uh, this can create singlet oxygens, which are known to be very highly reactive. And these are the these are the reactive oxygens that in the early days of photodynamic therapy, when people were killing cancer tumors cells with with light, yeah. this was the reactive oxygen, the singlet oxygen that they produced using porphyrins and blue light. Yeah, right. Now, that was the early experiments going on in this field. And uh, the, the problem was that they couldn't penetrate the blue light. The blue light wouldn't penetrate into the tumours. So it was very hard to um, to get the reaction occurring within the tumour cells so you could kill them. It tells the cells, it doesn't, it doesn't burn the cells, it tells them to commit suicide. <laughs> so... Um, so what we're doing with the blue light, we're, we're generating through the oxygen, we're generating reactive oxygens uh, that are potentially damaging. I mean, the reactive oxygens are used for other things. They're used for signaling between cells and so mm -hmm. on. So they're a central part of the biological process. But you get too many of them, they do too much damage. And so that, that's a problem. So we, we do know there's a pathway in the blue, uh, which is a sensitive function of wavelength. It's just in this range in the deep blue, where you can excite the porphyrin and uh, you can produce a reactive oxygen. Now, there's some subtleties here, which <laughs> I'll, I'll try and explain. But um, in mitochondria, uh, we know that mitochondria synthesize heme. Mm -hmm. uh, and to synthesize heme, you need to have a, a precursor molecule, uh, which is something called protoporphyrin, protoporphyrin 9. Mm -hmm. So this is a this is a porphyrin that doesn't have a metal in the middle. Now to make heme, you have to add iron into the into the, there's a, there's a there's an enzyme that does that. That's, so that's how you go off and synthesize heme. That same protoporphyrin molecule is the immediate precursor to chlorophyll. So in chlorophyll, it's porphyrin like uh, protoporphyrin like heme, uh, but instead of having an iron, it has a magnesium in the center. So this protoporphyrin. Uh, molecule is the, 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 the precursor to both heme and chlorophyll, The Colors of Life. There's a wonderful book by uh, right. Milk about, uh, about porphyrins. So it's presumably that protoporphyrin 9 is uh, highly conserved um, from many, many millions of years ago. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, yes. Yes, absolutely. And it's, it's, it was written, you know, it's, it's a photoactive molecule, and it was realized by the photodynamic therapists that, you know, this was a, they needed photoactive molecules because this photoactive molecule, when it's excited, produces reactive oxygen. So it's this porphyrin that produces the reactive oxygen. It's not the hemoglobin or the chlorophyll itself so much. It's this precursor uh, porphyrin that is such a, a generator of the reactive oxygens. And it explains in this book exactly how it happens. It's rather elegant, but it's, you know, it's deep quantum mechanics in a way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so we know that mitochondria at some time in their life cycle will contain protoporphyrin because they use it to generate heme. We don't know exactly what time of day that happens. Uh, those experiments ought to be done uh, by somebody, possibly by us, uh, but it's um, 
we're not terribly well equipped to do that, but um, we know that that protoporphyrin is present. And it's, we assume that while that protoporphyrin is present within the mitochondrion, it's very sensitive to, uh, to blue light. And so if we shine blue light on, on, on a mitochondrion while it's going through this process, it will cause damage. Do you have an inkling when the mitochondria will have the highest concentrations of this protoporphyrin? Well, I, I mean, I think we, we rather naturally assume that it's in nighttime because the, we know the mitochondria has kind of restructured themselves and rebuild themselves all the time, but they probably do this at night uh, and when they're not expecting any blue light. It's a safe time for them to do this. So we, we, we assume that it happens at night. So now we start shining blue light on everything at night. Yeah, uh, we're 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 doing a lot of damage, and this is this is probably uh, the dominant mechanism for the blue light problem. It's the fact that we're shining. It's not the blue light itself. If you do this at daytime, it's balanced by other processes, especially in the red. But if you shine blue light on uh, on mitochondria at night. Uh, you're not doing it any favors and um, this mm -hmm. is probably the origin of the problem.